everyone. We're going to get started. Um, first off is our associate <laughs> professor of biostatistics, Sebastian. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, so this is joint work with a bunch of people, including Harrison, who's going to be starting some of this stuff. I don't think he's in the room. He's going to be starting this stuff over the next year or two. Um, so for folks who know ventricular uh, arrhythmias are basically when your heart starts beating at, a, at irregular patterns, either too fast or too slow. And implantable cardioverted defibrillators, um, uh, ICDs are the only proven therapy for reduction of sudden cardiac death. And uh, so it's just an implant, it goes under the skin. When your heart starts doing something uh, abnormal, it gives you a shock. And then hopefully it sort of reestablishes the rhythm of your heart. And there's interest in understanding and predicting shock, so whether or not you're actually shocked. So these are individuals who are high risk of ventricular arrhythmias and then. Uh, and in part because there are trade-offs between the extended survival that is afforded by these ICDs and uh, the shocks themselves are pretty traumatic and dramatic um, when they occur, very, very painful, and there are sort of a sense that it's not so obvious what the trade-offs are, for, especially among the elderly, where these shocks can, they, the shocks themselves can, can cause mortality. And CMS, at the, um, at the same time, mandates the use of shared decision-making tools prior to new prevention ICD implantation. So there's a lot of interest in trying to understand basically who is at increased risk of getting a shock. So if you're going to do this, you might think about developing a risk prediction model. So this is something that we're interested in. We've got data from a, a trial of uh, some folks who were implanted and folks who were not implanted. And you could proceed within kind of pretty standard approaches for developing and evaluating risk prediction tools. So you would take um, shock as a, either a binary outcome or as a time to event outcome. You might do logistic regression or some machine learning method. And then uh, as, a, as, an as, a, as an outcome, you might evaluate it with RSC and LC to put sensitivity, specificity, and blah, blah, blah. And there are two comments that I might make just in terms, insofar as using kind of a standard approach for prediction to shock. And one is that death is a competing risk for shock. The, I think it's around 15 to 20% mortality. Um, it's not a trivial um, competing risk. And for my part, I think that um, given that it is death is a competing risk, my sense is that there's a degree of artificiality associated with thinking about the risk of shock separately from thinking about the risk of death. And I see it in terms of like, if you're gonna give me a number, here is your risk of shock. Um, when you go to the doctor, you seldom make decisions on the basis of one particular phenomenon or your risk for one particular phenomenon. Usually you're talking about lots of different things and your joint risk and your sort of profile of risk for all of these different things simultaneously. And so in thinking about these issues, instead of saying, well, what's your probability of getting a shock versus not, uh, we're sort of thinking about individuals at some point in time can end up in one of four categories. You can either have had a shock and be alive, you can either have had a shock and died, you could have died without a shock, you could have had neither, and, and of course those probabilities would add up to one. And so how do we get these probabilities? Um, practically, you can proceed, I think many folks know that I'm interested in semi-computing risks, so this is one representation of semi-computing risk, you get an implant, and then you can either get a shock and then die, or you can die without having had a shock. So death is a competing risk for shock, but not vice versa, and that's what semi-computing risks uh, essentially refers to. And from a modeling perspective, you can sort of take these three hazard functions, they, that they dictate the rates at which uh, folks transition from one state to the other, and you might put covariates in there, um, and, and these are the covariates that kind of predict your various probabilities. And you can take the output from that model and then compute these probabilities. <coughs> and what do you get out of it is you get predicted profiles that sort of look like this. So if you cross-sectionally, there are four buckets, right? You've got shock um, and no death, or shock and alive, shock and death, death alone and neither. And so cross-sectionally, there are four buckets and the probability to add up to one of them. And what you see in these pictures are that somebody's profile evolves over time. And it's telling you how an individual's risk of shock and death changes over time. That's the purple and the blue line. And so it provides sort of, I think, more information that hopefully is useful in clinical contexts rather than just a single number, a binary, you know, what's your probability of getting a shock versus not. And then just, this is just giving you a sense that there's, even in the data that we have, there's a lot of heterogeneity. I mean, there's a lot of heterogeneity in people's profiles. So this person over here, for example, has got a very high overall risk of mortality. This is a five-year period, whereas this person's got a very low risk of overall mortality. And you might take the purple and the, uh, sorry, this is, uh, sorry, the purple and the, and the blue are the shock. So anyway, my sense is that there's an opportunity here for, to sort of go beyond the usual binary state of are you getting a, a, a shock or not. 
And so we can compute these probabilities, we can give you these profiles, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're thinking about right now. One is variable or feature selection via regularization. So you have these models, you might throw in you know, potentially 100 variables, and then which ones do you keep? Which ones actually contribute to computing these probabilities? Um, there's lots of, um, beyond regression, there are sort of modern machine and deep learning methods that you might use to compute, uh, to, to generate these probabilities. So possibly outside of the context of these on these death models, that's something else. Two more bullet points. Um, decision rules, usually with ROC, it's like you're in one bucket, you're diseased versus not, but here we've got four buckets. So how do we evaluate decision rules? Um, how do we even construct decision rules? Um, you know, in the ROC analysis, you're, you, you know, here's a threshold, and if you're above the threshold, you're diseased, if you're below the threshold. We've got four buckets, and so you'll need more than one threshold. Um, and so these are various things that we're working on. Any questions for Sebastian? Hey. Um, is any of the um, variability outcome caused by things like um, quality of the placements? And are we able to assess any of that after the uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they have that specifically in the um, in the heart failure trial, but you know if. If that was felt to be an important predictor and it was something that was measurable, you could certainly fold it into all of this. I was curious what the input variables are to make these predictions. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't have that information right in hand. I mean, it's, it's a bunch of stuff that was collected as part of this trial. Um, to be honest, this, yeah, I don't think that these particular data are that rich, but this is just um, the data that we have right now. I'm actually, I put in an R01 for some of this stuff with some folks in nutrition and um, trying to predict. There are lots of other outcomes that you can think about. We're going to pr build prediction models for preeclampsia among women who are pregnant. You can build prediction models for people who get acute graft versus host disease. If you get a, a, a bone marrow transplant, we've, we've got plans for lots of different risk models. Please. Have you thought about um, your, the uncertainty in these predictions of, of the probabilities? Because it seems like that can make a Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, um, I don't even know how that uncertainty is dealt with in binary setups. Um, usually it's just sort of a threshold and then that's it. But um, one would imagine that there would be some uncertainty that you, you want to fold into the decision making process. Sure. Uh, interested in is, you know, do you start to compute the and weight the different outcomes differently because I would guess death is far more costly than shock. So that, and so I don't, um, you know, it I was involved with a group who was trying to predict rapid kidney decline, and there, it, you know, it was really weighting false positives versus false negatives. You don't care so much about the false negatives, uh, about the false positives. What you really care about are the false negatives. It's, it's because the decision point was whether whether to refer somebody to treatment or not. Right. Yeah, so that's not the decision point that's going to be going on here. Right? The decision point here is, I, I guess, is whether or not to implant the ICD. Right. And, and so, um, you know, I'm not the physician in the room, but my, I took this literally directly from our paper, that trade-offs between extended survival, which is, you're arguing that that's the more important outcome. Apparently, that's not so straightforward, that the trade-offs, especially among right. the elderly. Right, you just the weights. Well, there's no weighting. That's part of the point of this, is that there's no weighting. You're, you're getting a profile. And perhaps you're talking about the decision rule, how yeah. you might use this information in constructing a, dis a personalized decision rule that says, yes, at the end of the day, we're going to have the implant versus not. Yeah. And that, yeah, so, yeah, I agree. So weights might come into some loss function um, that you then try to optimize, but that would be presumably personalized. Right, it would be, you know, my weight might be different than your weight. All right, thank you. I'll let the next people go on. Um, next, we're going to have May Shang Da speak. Um, May is a graduate of the EPI department here, and she's a visiting scientist now, and um, is a principal and pharmacoepidemiologist at the analysis group. Yeah, so I was told I'm not supposed to do any commercial. So, uh, 
I put you in 1997 in the department. I remember it's Jenny. Then I hear you had the first doctoral qualifying exam on G excavation. <laughs> Half of the students in my cohort had to retake the qualifying exam. <laughs> <laughs> so I am very pleased to come back here and talk about marginal structural model, <laughs> which basically, again, Jamie was the inventor and creator. And unbeknown to me, after 20 something years graduating from the school, I'm using this in real world at work for corporations in the context of pharmaceutical research. So I promise I have no mess medical equations. <laughs> in my presentation, I think the purpose for today, uh, from my perspective, is to kind of broaden your exposure in terms of the applications of the methodologies you have learned in this school and how that can be used to actually uh, to change the corporate America, how they do research and improve the quality of their research. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to that. <laughs> 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 it's not that sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you a project that we are about to undertake, um, sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. I would say the best part is when you apply for your learning school and then corporations are willing to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> um, so in this particular situation, it's actually very relevant in oncology research. In real world, as those of you who work on, in oncology know that nowadays there is an explosion of new therapies available in oncology. In, immunotherapies, CAR-T, uh, targeted therapies, and the, over the genomic uh, screening tools allow you to identify different genomic gen genetic mutations and create targeted therapies. So many therapies available. So for an oncologist, the question is, which drug should I use as the first treatment? When I have a patient who, in this particular case, I'm talking about non-small cell lung cancer. As you know, each drug company, when they conduct clinical trials, is one drug only, and they compare to a standard care. Every drug company always say, my drug is the best, so doctor, please use my drug as the first one. So now, how do you address that question for treating physicians? Because they all look similar. Uh, and the other thing is that for oncology, as you know, the most important endpoint is overall survival for these patients. Death is the ultimate endpoint happen at the end of the life. So anything happen in between, in between, has to be accounted for in order to be causally correctly attribute treatment effects to the outcome of overall survival through different lines of therapy. So this is where the marginal structural model to adjust for time-dependent confounding become very relevant. Um, so I, um, in this particular case, I am just illustrating why treatment change is not randomly assigned in real-world pra clinical practice physician start patient on a particular drug for a reason, and then when a patient progress, the next drug they choose is also not random. It's dependent on patient's prognostic factors. So along the way, the treatment sequencing, the whole sequence is not randomized. So now, if you were working for a drug company, how do you prove my drug is the best one for you to start with, or most drug company want to position their drug as the first one. <laughs> so the most common question we treatment sequence for treating physicians. And then what's the optimal treatment sequencing that's basically associated with the, the, the improvement in overall survival benefit. Um, so that's basically the second objective I mentioned. The first objective is what do you start with? This is not as simple as it sounds because when you start with first line, and then now you want to look at the, associate, the association with the death endpoint. You have to take into account every, anything happening in between. The treatment sequence is, if you start first line on drug A, second line on drug B, third line on drug C, how do you evaluate the benefit of that sequence versus X, Y, and Z all together? Again, compared to at the very end, the benefit of the survival benefit for these patients. So this is basically what the graph is about. So the, um, the counterfactual models that Jamie has 
invent it. <laughs> Nowadays, it's very popular in the pharmaceutical application. Um, and the idea is that traditional time-dependent Cox model is actually insufficient to adjust for the causal pathway. Um, the the time-dependent uh, Cox model usually only adjusts for time-varying covariates, but it doesn't take into account <laughs> sure, why, why you are getting this treatment. What were the prognostic factor that contributing to a physician decide to give you a particular therapy. Uh, so since my time is up, I'll, and the marginal structural model, I trust all of you here know what it is. <laughs> so uh, I actually just finished a presentation at a drug company and my goal was to educate them about marginal structural model and Jenny's name was brought up again and again and again. <laughs> so um, the other, lastly, I just want to mention in the industry setting, the data sources we use may be a little bit different from what you have access to in, in academia. Uh, so we usually have ex, uh, get access to more real world data like oncology uh, type of uh, data sources. This is from, uh, 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 this is a database called Flatiron and it's from a community oncology network. Um, so we get to work with very interesting data. And Optum is an insurance database. Avalier is a Medicare database. Um, and lastly, about analysis group, we are located in Prudential Center right down the street on Eli. Um, so anybody uh, would like to talk to me after the meeting, I'm, I'm going to be right there. Thank you. Lucas Henneman, he's a postdoc here working with Corey Ziegler, who I think is joining us today as well. Yeah, I'm actually here. Yay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My lightning symbol kind of cut out. <laughs> um, great, thanks. Um, very quickly at the beginning of my talk, I just want to, uh, well, first of all, this is work with a bunch of people who were here, are still here in some capacity, Corey's my advisor. Um, but quickly at the beginning, just to motivate things a little bit, uh, you might think that since I've been working here as a postdoc for the last year and a half in the Department of Biostatistics, that I knew something about biostatistics before I came here. Um, but it's not true. Uh, <laughs> I, I come from an environmental engineering background. I'm, I'm here to sort of, we're working on similar project problems and I'm coming from more of a, a modeling atmospheric uh, sciences uh, background. So that'll help motivate what I'm gonna talk about for the next four and a half minutes. Uh, all right, so let's talk about coal power plants. Um, there are about a thousand electricity generating units that burned coal uh, in the mid 2000s to late 2000s. Their SO2 emissions, which is a pollutant that's harmful to health, decreased by about two-thirds over that time period. Uh, and in order to achieve those reductions, um, we spent a lot of money. So to the tune of tens of, tens of billions of dollars a year. Um, and just to give a little bit more spatial uh, information, this is where the coal power plants are located, mostly in the eastern side of the, of the United States. Um, and so this leads to the question, uh, are we getting the benefits that we hoped for when we uh, required coal power plants to put in the, the emissions controls to reduce the emissions? Um, in order to figure this out, there are some intermediate questions that we have to answer. So one is, if you have a, a power plant that's emitting pollutant, pollution, uh, where does that pollution go? <coughs> uh, then if you were to change the emissions, uh, who benefits? Uh, from that change? Uh, where does the exposure decrease? Um, and so what we need to answer this question is, is a sort of nimble uh, approach uh, where we're connecting sources to population. So for example, this power plant in um, Alabama emitted pollutants and it traveled across the country. Uh, we want to know where that's happening and how that's changing over time. Uh, so we built that. Um, we call it high ads. Uh, compared to some atmospheric models, it's a lot simpler. It doesn't include um, detailed chemistry. Uh, 
uh, we're really just interested in where the pollution is going and who's impacted by it. Um, but in exchange for that reduced complexity, uh, we're able to scale this up and run it as many times as we want. So uh, we can get contributions to exposure from all of the thousands of coal power plants. Um, at any time period, we can run it for different counterfactual scenarios. Um, and so this broadly expands the types of analyses that we can do. Uh, this, for example, is what it looks, looked like in 2005. Uh, you can see the highest exposure is, as you'd expect, close to uh, power plants, and it gets lower when you move west or further away from the power plants. Um, so running this across the time period that I talked about, where we saw a two-thirds reduction in emissions, uh, it led to about the same reduction in exposure. Uh, this exposure is similar to PM 2.5. So coal emissions can go on in the atmosphere, they react, they produce PM 2.5. Uh, it also has uh, other sources. So some of the reduction in PM 2.5 there is coming from this reduction in coal emissions. Some of it's coming from others. Um, so in order to investigate the health impacts of that, we use the difference in difference approach. Uh, the benefits of this is that uh, we're comparing the same areas uh, and looking at their changing exposure over time. We're canceling out the different characteristics between areas um, that are associated with similar exposure levels and health outcomes. Uh, and by applying this, we mitigate the threat of confounding by both observed and unobserved uh, factors. Um, and so this is what the model looked like, where we have the change in rates associated with the change in exposure, and then uh, we control for both the covariates as they were in 2005 and the covariates change between 2005 and 2012. Um, for a secondary analysis, we replace this uh, change in exposure term uh, with the quantiles in the change of exposure. Um, and we can talk about why that's interesting at the end, if we want. Um, so this is the results for six different health outcomes in the Medicare data. Um, this is showing that, for example, for COPD, uh, we didn't see much change uh, in COPD associated with a change in PM 2.5. <laughs> Guy. Nice. <laughs> Perfect, I have one more slide. Um, but for coal exposure, we do see a reduction associated with uh, a reduced coal exposure. And those results are kind of similar for all of these six outcomes. Um, and we get pretty similar results between the primary and secondary analysis. Um, I will say this is kind of cherry-picked results. There were four other uh, health outcomes, uh, including all-cause mortality, that we didn't see any uh, association there. And so to wrap up, uh, I talked about the Hyatt's approach, where we're able to connect sources and populations. Um, we were able to show that for lots of different health outcomes, uh, we actually did receive benefits from these uh, emissions reductions. Looking forward, uh, some interesting questions we're trying to address is how much of those of the exposure or health benefits that we saw from the reduction uh, are due to emissions, uh, how much are due to changing meteorology, because uh, that has an effect on who's exposed as well. Um, and then which types of energy transitions are leading to these benefits? So I just looked at total change in emissions. Some of those are, are uh, due to uh, emissions controls. Some of those are due to moving more towards natural gas and away from coal uh, and other renewables. And so we're going to keep looking into that. Thanks. How do you track the emissions from a single plant? So we're using uh, wind fields. So we have um, gridded wind fields uh, that are direction and speed. So you don't put a tracer in or anything? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, are you able to look at whether there's effect modification by um, meteorology conditions, like whether some things would do well under certain meteorologic conditions but not under others? What do you mean by do well? Like the, the interventions that are done to reduce the emissions would have more of an impact under certain conditions than others. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly from a, phys so this is where mine goes, from a physical modeling standpoint, uh, we can separate, separate out impacts of meteorology, for instance, where the pollution goes versus where it doesn't, or what happens to SO2 when it's in the atmosphere um, versus not. I assume from a statistical standpoint there's a way too, but that that's why I'm here to learn more about it. I mean, before I follow up question, I really liked your logo for the lightning talk. Is it okay oh, to thanks. adopt that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, actually it, was that from the first slide? Yeah. So this isn't the one that I thought it was going to look like. <laughs> I thought it was the emoji lightning, but I think the math to PC transition didn't happen. So send us your original one. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Hey, did you mean the I am not a biostatistician? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't suggest everyone use that one. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, how do you control for confounders like, you know, that the treatment in general, you know, became better over time? Versus the treatment meaning? Like, you know, when we have a disease. So that uh, is one, I don't think we're controlling for them completely, but using the difference in difference, um, since we're comparing the same areas, along with lots of other um, confounding variables. So we're, at least on some level, looking at trends over time that are outside of just the pollution. Thank you. And we're just going to get set up for Jamie Robbins, professor of epidemiology. an expectation, so you take a sample average. You see an A, a Y, so you put a Y. <coughs> You'd see a B, and you'd regress Y on X somewhere. You put an estimate, and you solve pi, you put regress uh, A on X. Now, usually you'd say everything's fine if you using parametric models and things are okay, and maybe they're okay, but we're assuming X is really high dimensional, and so these are really hard regressions to use, so what do we do? Deep learning. <laughs> so we estimate from the deep learning. The problem with deep learning is no one understands anything about <laughs> statistical properties. It's a black box. So the question is, if you have a black box that <coughs> estimated that, and, um, and I form a confidence interval based on that estimate, plus or minus 1.96 standard errors, and I report that covers 95% of the time, and I ask you, you know that, since they don't know anything about being asked to Pi Max. Well, 
when people try to say that, they make assumptions about how good these machine learning programs are with your particular data set, your particular X's, nobody has any idea. So they just wave their hands and hope you believe them. And so the question is, can you test whether their confidence intervals are valid? That is, they cover the true co covariance in hypothetical repetitions 95% of the time without making any assumptions. I mean, no assumptions. So you don't want to know. You're going to uh, assume smoothness or sparsity because you have know, hundreds of thousands you know, cover Who knows? I mean, what any of this is. So that's the question. So the way is to say, what can you say when you know nothing? And it's usually considered the answer to that is nothing, which is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people who just reported a confidence interval of coverage. Now, if you think about what makes a confidence interval cover, it's the simple thing is it's bias has to be how far the mean is of the estimator uh, has to be a lot, the bias of the estimator, it's the mean from the truth, has to be a lot less than the standard error because you've got to be centered or else it's not going to cover if it moves around. So what is the bias of this estimator? Well, I can compute it. It's the mean of b minus b hat times pi minus pi hat. It's just the inner for the x the inner product, as it were, the expectation of the error in B times the error in pi. The problem is I know nothing about the error in B. I know nothing about the error in pi because I'm making no assumptions. And they've given me a confidence in And I know nothing. But when you know nothing, there's only one thing you can do. Criticize. <laughs> and so if I, so I have a procedure. Anybody who ever reports a confidence interval, I all the same me your data. <laughs> and then I have a procedure that can tell them things like with um, confidence 98%, your interval doesn't cover more than 1%, not 95. Those are the kind of statements I can make. Okay, let's, ass and let's assume I can say that why in a second, except I've probably used up my time. So I won't. <laughs> but suppose I can't say, I say, for all I know, your interval cover is fine. I don't have any information. Does that make you proud of your interval? No, because I know nothing, you know nothing. <laughs> that doesn't tell you. So this is what you call an inconsistent test. I can test whether you're wrong, but if my test fails to reject, that's no evidence at all you're right. Because it's impossible to know whether you're right, because how do I know what the true bias is under no assumptions? So the idea is it turns out this bias here and notice the bias is what we call, for those who don't know, doubly robust, because if I had b hat equals b, I have no bias. If I have pi hat equals pi, I have no bias. So I have two chances to get it right, but that's no help, because if I'm doing both of them terrible, probably. So, um, so the question is, what you do is, I can't estimate that bias. I can't even get close to order one. Remember, the standard error is going down as one of the square root of n. I can't even get to order one, because I'm making no assumptions. But I can estimate part of that bias um, because there's, you can just take this big bias and divide it into pieces. <laughs> if you can estimate part of it, and part of that bias is like 20 standard errors, you know, you can say the bias is 20 times standard error of the person. Okay, if it's just this little part of the bias, you could say, not too good. Your confidence in it all is not going to cover very well. And so that's what I do. So I can, if I reject, I can tell you your confidence is terrible. But if I accept, you know, I can't tell you your confidence is terrible. It doesn't mean it's any good at all. It just means I didn't have power here. And there's no test that can have power because I'm making no assumptions. So this is a weird thing, but it's a way everybody can do it. And what you do, well, you use second order influence, uh, use statistics to estimate part of the bias, but I'm sure my five minutes is up. But um, so that's, so when you know nothing, the message is you can criticize, but don't ever try to say anything positive. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I, I can say it's, you know, this part's that big, but you don't know for all I know, it goes over to you. So you know <laughs> you can't know. I, I mean, because I'm really not you know what the conference is, because I'm assuming these programs don't know what they're doing. I mean, obviously, as time goes on, more and more, there can be more and more math about how good these programs are doing things, but the math's always going to say they're doing good if this untestable fact is true, like this much smoothness, I have this much sparsity. So there's an interesting question to me. What could you say about these procedures if you refuse to <laughs> accept anything? Is there anything you could say completely non paradoxically And as I said, you could criticize, but you can't say anything else. Okay. So get ready to lie. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>